Good morning. I'm John Lambert from Microsoft. I am excited to be here. Yeah, thank you all. Um, hold on, I got to get a selfie with the largest conference, the largest audience for NullSec. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. All right. Um, I had some excitement getting here. Uh, when I showed up to the airport in Seattle, they said, your flight's canceled. Um, we can rebook you. You can get there on Sunday. I said, uh, my flight is set. I got to talk on Saturday. Uh, so the airline hit me with a zero-day attack before I even got here. Um, but I got to say, um, luckily I had zero trust that everything would go according to plan. So I had uh, a backup strategy. And uh, 36 hours of travel later, um, here I am. So, okay, let's see if we can get the slides back here. Okay. For me, um, look, before I tell you about what I'm going to talk about, let me tell you why I'm here. Uh, so in 2009, I got to NullCon by way of Beijing. I went to this conference called XCon in Beijing. It was really uh, the opening up of China, China's researcher communities to broader international audiences. I went there and spoke, and I met this guy. Uh, Asim, and he told me, uh, hey, you got to come to NullCon. And the thing I didn't realize is in 2009, there, there was no NullCon in 2009. Um, it was uh, the year before, so they were just planning it here. Um, let's see. They were just planning it, and... Um, Many years later, I met Antrix at Blue Hat, and he said, hey, you should come to NullCon and speak. And so um, I have a team in India, and this year was the right year for me to come and visit. Um, one of the things that um, is, is part of the reason that brought me here is the conferences like this, they're all about community. Um, they're all about, um, they're all a labor of love. These are these research conferences are put on by researchers for researchers, uh, and that's part of the reason that I think it's valuable to come and meet you all uh, and, and present and speak uh, there. Um, the, my journey into security really um, had kind of a very circuitous route. I started outside of college at IBM, and the reason I got into security at IBM was as the new guy... Um, when they pick what project or feature you're going to work on, you don't get to pick. Like, you get what's left over. What was left over? Security was left over. And I don't know, but there's something about it that just got in my blood, like the attack, the defense, the perfection required, the creativity that's there. Um, there was just something really fascinating about that. And so I kind of wanted to know, like, raise your hand if you've been in security or been interested in security for two years or less. Okay, all right. And then how many have been, feel like they've been at security for more than 10 years? Okay, how about more than 20? Okay, uh, well, I got to say to everybody that's new and interested in this, welcome. I think you'll find this a fascinating, uh, amazing area. My career after, um, in 2000, I joined Microsoft. And my career, if you notice, everything in orange here, um, was some cybersecurity incident. And I felt like at Microsoft, I had a front row seat at those. Going from the early days of Code Red, Blaster, and the I Love You worm, did anybody remember the Blaster or Code Red or SQL Slam or any of those worms? Yeah, so um, those, that was my initiation into what security vulnerabilities became. And then uh, Stuxnet and Flame, and I would say as a security person, um, you mark your career sometimes in a very different way than people, than maybe other engineers or other professions. If you worked uh, as an engineer or a developer, you might say, well, I worked on this product and then I worked on that product. I worked on V1 and then I worked on V2. I got to say in security, I'm like, oh, I worked on MSO3026. And they're like, yeah, but do you remember MSO7029? And I'm like, oh, yeah, but MSO8067, that was amazing. And these vulnerabilities and the incidents really become sort of the signpost markers in a, in a long career. But what I found in working those incidents is that um, incidents, when you work incidents like these, 
They really are a profound source of truth. And I always felt in security it was very important to just be very grounded and, and just rub, you, rub reality in your face. Because uh, it is definitely an area and a profession where if you're just not grounded about the art of the possible, uh, have humility about where you're actually at with it, um, you know, it's going to knock you one serious. And these incidents often contain very powerful insights in them about what was possible in the world of attack, but also they were very galvanizing often to the defenders, uh, certainly at Microsoft, and many different programs and, and, and uh, features and things that carried on for years uh, were sparked by many of these incidents. So part of what I want to talk about today is um, how, like, these, these incidents, because they can be so transformational, how do you go about finding them? I mean, sometimes they happen to you. A solar winds, it happens to you, maybe. But also remember that all of that solar winds was uncovered by Mandiant's work. They understood this intrusion that was happening. And so it's very important to find the skills and have the skills to find these things in the first place when they're happening. So I thought I would take you through some of my journey, uh, what it's been like to, how do you find the big incidents, make some of those discoveries, and then those can become those watershed moments. Um, I'd like to also mention that there's this, often this myth uh, in the world of offense uh, attack where um, attackers have all the advantages. They certainly have tons of tools and malware and command and control frameworks, and there's no shortage of those projects on GitHub. And that the metaphor for defense is often just, it's like just one thing. It's like the shield. Like, that's the only idea that we have in defense is just like the take the blows. Um, but in reality, defense can be a very creative field as well. And like this, for example, this device, this is a gunshot detector. So cities can put these around and they can understand where, a crime, where crime may be happening and respond even sooner before someone calls the emergency line. Um, obviously, if somebody breaks into a window, this is a favorite one of mine, which is, um, these are called stumble steps. And castles use these in their defenses where an invading army, as they penetrated the castle walls, they'd have to come up, you know, very key narrow choke points, and these steps had intentionally, like, very, uh, like, uneven depth to them, uneven height to them, trying to induce failure. And I'll talk later about how the idea of inducing failure in attackers uh, can help you sometimes make discoveries. Uh, from tamper detection to honey, honey uh, net systems, uh, honey pots, trying to use terrain in the world of cyber by having obstacles. All of these, I'd say the toolkit in the world of Defenders is actually very rich and very creative as well. Um, so with that, let me talk about some uh, strategies on how to add to your threat intelligence and make it bigger. Um, normally, the world of threat hunting, it sort of looks something like this, where you, you read the MITRE attacks and you learn all the different techniques there. You keep up on the tweets and the blogs and you go to conferences and learn new things. Uh, to do detection and hunting, you might write some YAR rules or Sigma rules or do some hunting queries, and then you search and you find. Um, I want to walk through three areas uh, in how to find more intelligence, make more discoveries. The first is some foundational concepts that if you've been in security and you do any kind of role with a SOC or with hunting, you'll go, yes, this is the way we see the world. But if you're not... I'll say, for me, each one of these things kind of became like a new way I saw the world after I'd learned it. Um, and then some strategies, and then I'll go into some specific concrete tactical examples. Okay, so let me start with the foundational concepts. So this uh, gentleman on the right here, his name is Dr. Locard. He was born in France in the 1800s. And if you've ever watched a detective show where they're trying to find the murderer, and you go, like... Who was the first detective? Like, how did they even invent that specialized role? I think they all, all of those um, stories lead back to this gentleman here. And he was kind of the, the first one to think about what it meant to go really analyze these complex crimes. And so there is a, he has a famous phrase, which is, every contact leaves a trace. And it was, this was way before cyber. Um, but, you know, the idea was when a crime is committed uh, and that murderer or perpetrator is there, like, there's going to be a fingerprint, uh, there's going to be a scrape, uh, there might be some blood, there's going to be traces. And if you know everything that that um, 
criminal did is going to leave a mark somewhere, and you just need to know how to find it. And when you find it, those things are irrefutable facts. And in our world, uh, every contact does, does leave a trace in a log. And so to defend a network, you need to collect logs from all over your network in order to do that. And part of the work as defenders is realizing that every attacker action with the right set of data is going to have a record of that activity. And as a defender, um, I'll, I'll use this, uh, I, think, I think the NSA in the United States said this, but if not, it was described to them, which was, what do they fear the most in terms of a network to go in? Well, it was a well-managed network with a network tap capturing every packet. And the idea behind that that they were afraid of with a quote like that is, um, if it's recording everything, that's going to potentially uh, lead them to get discovered. And the same thing here, if you collect these logs and retain them in some version of a big data system, um, it's like you have imprisoned that attacker activity in those logs. And even if they get away for it for a short period of time, it's there for you to find. So a lot of our work as defenders is understanding how to translate all these attacker techniques in how to find them in these log sources. And so this is an example of an attacker may add an email forwarding rule to an account they've compromised. This could be a business email compromise scenario or somebody that's spearfished uh, a user and wants to get all of their future email exfiltrated. And you have to know, how do you find somebody adding one of these rules in your log sources? And so this, every contact leaves a trace in a log. The next um, foundational concept is that attacker actions, all, these are all the different categories in MITRE ATT&CK from um, lateral movement, privilege escalation, back doors, you name it. And each one of them can be embodied in tradecraft that lives at, at one or more layers of, of a system. And so if you're not finding attackers, sometimes you have to think about how they might express those attacker techniques in many different layers. And think of it like using a prism where um, it's possible, say, if somebody wants to have a back door, um, they could certainly write malware and you could look for executables and DLLs and things that shouldn't be there, but they may say, I don't need, I don't want that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run in memory. And they have to think about, well, how do you find things that might bootstrap that thing in memory? Because you're not going to find anything on disk that's going to be helpful. Or a different attacker, uh, they may say, look, I don't even need to use malware. I'm just going to live off the land and use the built-in operating system tools and application functionality because, you know, those apps and systems are there to be managed, and all I need to do is use those tools. And so you should think about um, all these different attacker techniques can be expressed at any number of logical layers in a system. And you have to think about your coverage map in those things and then discovering activity in those things. And then the last foundational concept um, I'll talk about is, is pivoting. And the idea behind pivoting is um, you have all of these different logical sets of data in your network. Uh, data is how defenders see. You have information from hosts and devices, operating system event logs and things like that, uh, syslog. You have applications that those users in the network use. You have identity in terms of logons and access attempts and things like that, as well as network. And each one of these log sources, however it maps in your network, um, pivoting is the, the way that you go from one data source to another through some kind of selector or key identifier. So if you find malware or something on a host, and you find it communicating to some command and control, defenders will then go and pivot and say, who else is talking to that C2 domain or C2 URL? They may get back to another host on their network where there's different malware than they previously had found, and that's where the attacker is active, and they're using one of the accounts and credentials from that network to go and access the exchange server or get email, and that leads you back to why the attacker is there in your network. So this notion of having all of your data sources with an easy way to pivot from one data set to the other through key selectors. And get, like if you have a great pivoting library or pivoting know-how, that is really going to speed up the work of defenders here. Um, OK, let me get on to strategies next here. OK, thank you. <clears throat> so now I want to talk about some strategies. Um, the first one is if you're having difficulty finding attackers, one thing you can do is zoom out. And so this is the MITRE ATT&CK matrix, and it's mostly meant for defenders to look inside 
their enterprise inside their network and their applications. But the reality is attackers are busy way outside of your network all the time. Um, they are um, they're registering new infrastructure. They are um, compromising identities. They are operating on other victims besides yourself. They're maintaining that attacker infrastructure. And then they're taking, exf they're taking exfil and taking that outside of the network. Um, and so one of the things that you can do is hunt attackers when they're not even in your network. And that is sort of the work of threat intelligence and threat intelligence professionals. Uh, one thing you'll see is how do you get that intelligence? Uh, well, there's a number, like you might think these threat intel feeds are very expensive and maybe not as available, but there's actually a, a large number of low cost uh, and no cost threat feeds that are available to threat hunters. But the idea with Zoom Out is don't just look when they're inside your network, but also look when they're well outside of your network as well. Okay, so the next concept I want to introduce to you in strategies, instead of just hunting uh, one by one, like taking a technique, turning it into hunting queries, and then looking one after the other after the other. Um, there's an idea of like almost turning hunting into like a breath first search. And I'm going to use an example here uh, with an attack called the sticky keys attack. And how many of you have ever heard of the sticky keys attack in Windows? Maybe raise your hand. I see a few. Oh, you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to watch you very closely here. So the sticky keys attack, um, I've, seen this, uh, I've seen this used before where the attacker wants to have backdoor access to your machine and they realize in advance that they may lose um, all access to that host. Like their, their intrusion may get discovered and all the credentials they have, have been, will be reset. And so, but they want to come back and they, know they don't want to have malware or whatnot on that host because that might get found. So they set the single registry key, and if you set the single registry key, as the attacker you can get back in. And the way that it works is, imagine you've lost access, you're the attacker, you've lost access to the system. Um, you can terminal serve to it, you can RDP to it, but you no longer have any valid username and password. So how do you get in? Well, uh, in Windows you hit the shift key five times, and instead of getting this, if you set this register key, now you get a command prompt as local system on the login desktop and then from there you can add another account and, and in you go. And so as a defender, if you want to look for like who might be doing this, you can turn this into a query in your query tool of choice, find attackers setting the sticky keys attack and then coming back later you go, well did they actually invoke it? In this case they did. And what did they do in that attack session? And so rather than just look for other instances of sticky keys, you go, what are these attackers doing once they get hands on keyboard? And this was uh, an example uh, where the first thing they did when they got in is they ran this executable. This is like their malware installer. Uh, the second thing they did is in Windows, you can set a registry key with some text. And when you log on to a system, that registry key is used to provide like a legal notice to the user, like this system is for official use only, uh, you can't use it for anything criminal, et cetera. Well, these attackers, they don't like those warnings, so they just delete them off of systems. Um, then they add some backdoor accounts and they chose some clever names to blend in to something that would look sort of normal. Uh, this attacker is gonna send spam, so they download their turbo mailer and they also want to earn some Bitcoin and do some crypto mining in the background. So that's what this attacker was doing. But each one of these uh, things they did becomes another hunting query, hunting seed. And you can look for other instances of attackers, probably beyond this one, like deleting uh, legal, legal notice captions and things like that. And so the idea of hunting until the closure of the pivoting is turning this hit here, um, where because you have logs, you can go backwards in time and find out how did they get in. You go forwards in time and find out what did they do once they had access and then begin this, profit, this process of exhausting all of these different ideas that you stumble across where it's almost like uh, you know, uh, the Fibonacci sequence where like you write one analytic and then uh, that leads to a detection and then you run that detection and you get two attack elements that you find in it and then you write another detection for those two attack elements and then you get three more other affected systems and then you get five new attacks from investigating those and it just, you just keep going and I call this like iterating until the closure of all the pivoting and you'll get a bonanza of ideas and techniques. The other strategy uh, I want to talk about is time travel breach detection. 
Normally, let's say you're worried about some particular attacker and you want to know how they might get into your network and maybe you get some fresh intel that says this is how they spear fish or how they get in. Well, if they're already in your network, none of that intelligence is going to help because they're not going to spear fish you at that moment going forward. They're already resident in your network. And what you need to know is what does their persistence look like? What does their entrenchment look like? And you may not actually have the information about what that may look like. And so if you maintain that big corpus of logs, you don't have to search them now. You can go search for the attacker any time they were around in their intrusion. Where if you, sometimes it's easier to find them based on some of their earlier techniques. And then once you find them, if you have that log history, you can just roll forward to see what are they up to now and what, is, what do their back doors look like. And I've definitely used this myself where um, when we've had uh, major waves and outbreaks of attacks uh, and attackers have submerged, during the earlier phases of their attack, uh, they're a lot noisier because they're having to do broad enumeration, broad lateral movement, they're dumping creds on lots of systems to gather maybe eventually administrator creds, and it's easier to almost search for them there. And if you notice this, uh, the, the graphic of um, the um, MITRE attack, some of, the, some of the phases of it are shorter than others because the number of techniques there, they're just not as many. Like there's probably any number of command and control frameworks out there. You could tunnel C2 traffic through any different means and modality, but there's only so many ways to dump credentials in, on a system. And so those shorter phases almost become like a bottleneck that you can really build some great detections for and go hunt for attackers as they transit those bottlenecks um, in, the, in the kill chain. Okay, now I'll get you some practical examples of some of these ideas, defensive ideas I talked about. So I'll start with the idea of a lot of what you might think is you go look for attackers being successful, doing things, pulling off of sticky keys, but you can also, if you don't know what to look for, you can start with failure. And one of those examples here with failure is uh, password spray. Very common thing if you have accounts on any cloud service the accounts are going to get sp password sprayed. And this is a query that shows looking for invalid logons uh, from people attempting password spray. Now what you really want to know is, is a user account compromised? Uh, but sometimes it's hard to know that. But you can use this, looking by looking for failures, you can gather all kinds of profiling information where attack, like IP addresses that attackers are coming from, user agent strings, other kinds of data that, that help you build up your own map of attacker infrastructure uh, against your own data, and then look for any, legit, any, any successful logon coming from uh, those IP ranges, uh, providers, et cetera, and that may give you a clue. If you see an IP address or range or um, that has otherwise... Um, uh, a very high number of failures, but then one or two successes, well, that's probably an attacker that correctly guessed a password. Um, and then uh, I want to give you an example of inducing failure using psychology. We use these in the honeypots that we operate at Microsoft. So the idea here is attacker's going to come into a system, and in this case, because it's a honeypot, we just let them in, but we want to gather as much intelligence about their malware, their domains, their infrastructure as possible. And so we induce failure in the attacker's mind. So let's say this attacker is going to go download their malware, test.jpg from baddomain.com with wget. Now, they think they're trying to install their malware here, but the reality is this is all fictional. We're just, we can return anything we want. So what do we do? We just say, um, Hey, we couldn't resolve that domain. It failed. So what is an attacker going to do when they're hands on keyboard and that doesn't work? They're going to go to their backup domain. So they're like, okay, well, let me try to curl from this thing. And we're like, yeah, it didn't work either. And then eventually they try something else. So by just giving them psychological failures, like just pretending the thing failed, you can see they're coughing up more threat intelligence to us. We're learning about new domains. Um, Another one, I talked about the idea of moving to more favorable terrain. Well, this, this is another example with honeypots about it. So a lot of malware that attackers upload is in uh, zip format, and it just doesn't have as much metadata as the tar format. And if you want to discover as much about attackers as you want, you'd like 
really want them to use the TAR format. And here's an example of other user and group information that's in TAR archives that is just not in zip files. And if you could have this, like you could imagine building a dictionary of these things, helping you understand where various toolkit is going and getting uploaded around the world. But obviously if they're going to upload a zip file, um, you're not going to get that. So in a honeypot you can just say, yeah, unzip command doesn't work. Sorry, use TAR. And then they're like, okay, well, I guess I've got to tar this stuff up and send it. So this is just uh, an example of, again, using psychology a bit here, but trying to get attackers to use something that is a little bit more favorable for defense. And then I'll tell you a few stories here uh, that came from my time hunting crash dumps. Uh, and this was the idea of um, what I wanted to find was zero days. But uh, that's, those are not necessarily easy to find. But often zero-day exploits, uh, especially those that exploit memory safety bugs, uh, that's a brittle thing that you're doing because you're injecting code into memory and you have to really know a lot about the internal state of the target. Uh, and so and if it doesn't work, the result is a crash and that crash would come to Microsoft. And so for a good number of years, I considered myself like an exploit failure engineer. Like I wanted to know all the reasons that exploits could fail because I wanted to find, uh, one, just understand what vulnerabilities were being weaponized um, and then and what were the techniques they used to do that and then I wanted to use that knowledge to find um, exploits for things that we didn't know we had a vulnerability in. So these are some examples of why exploits may fail. You can see this exploit here. It hard codes some very specific addresses on specific operating systems. Um, this one says if the target machine has data execute prevention turned on, he just didn't work around that. So it will crash as a result. Uh, this exploit writer says, look, I only tested on French. Uh, I didn't test on English or other loca locales. Um, and then sometimes we'll see a 32-bit exploit run against 64-bit windows. These are all reasons that exploits could fail. So the idea uh, here was exploits have a number of components to them to work in the things that I was looking at. So break down exploits into their, like, um, their essential elements. Like you need a vulnerability. That's a control hijack of some kind. Might be a stack overrun or might be a heap overrun. But then you also need some other components I'll talk about next. And write signatures for all these different components and treat them like the bones of a skeleton. And so that control hijack, let's say that's the head. But they're also going to need to say resolve some APIs to do some operating system functions. Well, that might be the arm bone. And write signatures for these things. And if you ever, if I ever found a crash dump that had an arm bone and a leg bone but not the rest of the skeleton, I knew right away that this had some new undiscovered attack stuff in it. So these are some examples of what the bones of the skeleton might be here. This is um, an example of a stack buffer overrun in Adobe Reader. And you can see here they've smashed the stack here and they've flood filled the stack with a NOP sled. Um, and then NOP sleds took, uh, th these are in, often in memory they didn't know exactly where their shell code would be located and so they pre-pended to their attacker shell code a long sled of useless instructions that would eventually, if it got control, you know, fingers crossed, it would slide down and execute all these instructions to get to their payload. So obviously NOP sleds came from the original NOP instruction, but really NOP sleds take any number of form you could possibly imagine with kind of instructions that just increment a register over and over again or do just something that does it and then undoes it like a push and a pop instruction. And then the next attack element uh, that I'll talk about is called the attacker needs to solve the problem of they want to encode their payload. Uh, they want to encode their shell code. And so um, to decode it before they run it, they need to understand where they are in memory. And that technique is called a git PC. So when this comes back, I'll show you um, how that worked. Okay, so this is the attacker shell code. The stuff at the bottom that looks kind of like confusing is, is encoded shell code. That's what he needs to decode. But he's got to find 
where the beginning of it is in memory. And so the attacker executes what's called a get PC where they start off with the jump instruction, they jump to this call instruction, and in x86, a call instruction will push the return address onto the stack. The return address is just this next location in memory. So he knows when he returns from that, that location of memory will be on the stack at a very specific point. And then he can start to run this XOR decode loop. So this is just a simple decoder uh, and it's doing a simple git PC, but this is another one of those attack elements. Um, and they'd also have to do things like resolve APIs and so they had very particular ways that they would do it and particular APIs that they would uh, use in shellcode. So the idea of the bones of a skeleton was um, look for and signature all of these different elements and then if you find, um, if I found a crash dump that only had say a git PC but no API resolver, well it's probably a new encoding routine by some new attacker. Or if they had shell code but I didn't have any obvious control hijack, uh, like how did the exploit get started? Um, that's probably a zero day. Um, so this is one of these tactics that you can use where you're trying to hunt something like a zero day but you don't know which application it's going to be in, you don't know what code it's going to be in, what vulnerability, you can use these different components here. And then one thing I'll say about perf um, um, attackers is at one point it became challenging to write exploits where you needed to be a professional almost to do it. The easy low hanging fruit had been eliminated. We built many different mitigations into the products over time. And it's like you had to be a professional. So that's the good news. The bad news is you're up against the professionals. But there's something about professionals that they take more care in how they write their attacks. And so one of the techniques here is you can hunt their professionalism. Because professional attackers are going to try and they'll do things like error handling. They'll do things like be a lot, they'll fingerprint the host and be aware of it. And so this is an example of a technique called an egg hunt and it's scanning through memory to find the payload. That's all you really need to know about it. But you can't just on a system just scan through memory arbitrarily because eventually not all memory is mapped and what's going to happen is you're going to crash. Now professional attackers know this and so they have a different technique on the right that is able to go scan memory safely uh, by using essentially kernel APIs to bounce off of. And um, if you wrote, when we wrote signatures just to look for these more, these techniques that it demonstrated higher care, um, this was what allowed us to find the some of the professional attackers. And sometimes we, I would see attackers that like, they operated seemingly only against targets in the Middle East and that's it. But through their professional trade craft, you know, you could see them. Um, so, that's sort of what I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to, uh, one, um, help you as defenders um, and think about ways to multiply more intelligence and find more things uh, and give you some foundational concepts, give you some strategies to zoom out and other ways to find attackers and then just some creative tactics and I'm sure you have your own that you use over time to uh, get, a leg up on these get a leg up on attackers and find the big incidents because it's when you find the big incidents that you can uh, have really a great acceleration in defense and investment in defense, the maturation of processes, the hiring of the talent that's needed, uh, and so on. So with that, uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank Nolcon for inviting me to speak today. And then sorry for some of the technical difficulties, but this is a hacker con and we make do with the best that we got. So thank you all. Yeah. <laughs>